Gustav Hallegraaf and I am a professor at the University of Tasmania, the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies. So in, in many respects, I had a very straightforward life because it was very early in my childhood. I had an uncle and who was a veterinarian and he gave me a little toy microscope and I looked at lots of different things like the wings of butterflies, but I ended up somehow taking a drop of water out of the, the rainwater tank that was in our backyard. I saw all these whirling creatures and that was it, you know, I was gonna study these creatures. I knew there was something very special about it. And I started to, uh, I'm a very good artist, make beautiful drawings and I showed them to my school teacher, my uncles, they're all very clever people, but nobody knew what they were. So I really was excited already, I was maybe 10 years old. I sort of discovered something new. And I went to the library and there were only two books and that probably helped. Um, one book was describing the life of Van Leeuwenhoek and he was the guy who developed the very first microscope and he just did that only about 30 kilometers away from where I had grown up. So I wanted to become an author from Leeuwenhoek. And then the other book explained about the oceans and the whales and the whales ate plankton. And I thought, my God, these small creatures are so important. So that was it, I was gonna study plankton. I've always been very creative and I think some reason for my success is continually reinventing myself and coming up with all the ideas, always trying to stay ahead of everybody else. So I moved to Australia and I started to find some species like the ones that you also have in, in Mexico, Chimney and but it had never been reported here before and had never been seen anywhere else in Australia at that point in time until I found a huge bloom in the local port of Hobart. And said, this is really strange. And so, and so all these ships coming and going. And said, oh, maybe it come in in the, in, in the ballast water of that ship. And it was a wild idea. And I originally came from the Netherlands. If I would have started to research that based in the Netherlands, everybody would have said, this is crazy because there's so many ships. Uh, it, it, you can't stop it. But I used the locality of Australia where quarantine is a very important issue. And I started to work with quarantine officers to collect samples from the ballast tanks of ship. And then my very first sample from a ballast tank of a ship, I found toxic dinoflagellates that I, I cultured. So, and that set me off on a wild goose chase, um, ultimately leading to molecular genetics, linking up ballast water cultures and the populations in my port with overseas strains. I moved it to the level of shipping engineers, moving it to the International Maritime Organization, and it was really almost 30 years since my original research that the International Maritime Organization in London ratified a, uh, an, a ballast water convention. So that is very gratifying. So uh, I actually here on my desk, I have a, uh, a goldfish. I always had... Uh, tropical aquariums or goldfish. Um, we actually have a pet, you may be able to hear it on the background. It's, it's a little dog, but it's kind of my wife's dog, my wife's dog, and it's, it's a border collie. And uh, it's called Murphy because my wife has Irish background. And like a lot of people, you know, we, I've not been able to, to travel myself for, for two years. And a lot of people then start to have cats and dogs as, as a company. So it's been good company for us, but it's going to be a problem if the, the borders open and we want to travel again. So we take that as it comes. And it, again, this, this reflects my passions because 
um, I ultimately found my wife here in Tasmania and we had a child and it is a daughter and I always wanted a daughter, beautiful daughter, blonde hair. And when she was born, like, of course, as a father, I was so elated and I wanted to give her a name that related to what my work. So either Thalassia, so that means the sea, but you know, one of my favorite organisms, such a beautiful one. I wanted to call her Planktoniella. So my wife was in the hospital, she did give birth. I wanted to call my daughter Planktoniella. And my wife, of course, didn't want to have a bar of it. And maybe she was right. Uh, anyway, so I ended up calling her Isabella because to me, it has the same ring. But when I started to lecture for big classes, I regularly uh, teach first year classes of 300 students. So it was one day and I was teaching diatoms. I showed this beautiful electromicrograph of plankton yellow. And there was a girl there on the front row. I said, wow, that's so beautiful. And I couldn't resist myself. I said, well, you know, I wanted to call my daughter. Planktonia, look how beautiful this organism is. And so everybody in the class thought that was really funny. But what I did not know, that that girl in my class was actually a good friend of my daughter. And so the story ultimately got out and my daughter got to hear that. She said, oh, I can really like that. But so then I became a bit more confident about this story. And it was a year ago, I was doing a a big uh, interview, standing on the ship, talking about the ocean. And that actually was aired uh, nationally in, in Australia. And so this, again, we, we were looking at plankton samples and there was plankton yellow there on the, on the screen and they were photographing it and interviewing me. And I kind of couldn't help myself. Yeah, I wanted to call my daughter plankton yellow. And so, Everybody now in Australia knows this story. And my daughter got bombarded with text messages from all of her friends. Oh, your dad wanted to call you Plankton Yellow. And my, my, my daughter said, oh, I can't really like that name. So I still hope that when she gets a daughter, that maybe my wishes will come true. <laughs> I probably would tell myself, you're doing absolutely the right thing. Keep keep going. Um, it may have been my Dutch upbringing, but so Dutch people are kind of very stubborn. You know, if if you know that you're right, you simply do it, and you don't let anybody stop you. Like all through my childhood, you know, I was going to study plankton. Everybody else around me told. If my parents had told me, well, you know, you're a clever boy. Go and do something useful with your life, you know, become a doctor or a lawyer. No, no, I want to study plankton and simply did it. Um, I did my PhD in the Netherlands and, but the Netherlands at that point in time, they were not doing much marine science, most of the aquatic research and the plankton work I did was focused on rivers and lakes. No, I wanted to study on the open ocean. So, then I decided to finish my PhD, I'm going to work on the open ocean. And I looked at opportunities and Australia was the first one. I, I packed a single suitcase and I went off to Australia. And I, I didn't think at all about the pain I caused for my friends and girlfriends and my parents I left behind. Um, but it worked for me, so I, I would not have establish such a good career if I hadn't making that made that big step. So I would tell myself, good on you, keep doing what you want to do and don't let anybody stop you. So it's probably the same message. It's just do what you want to do. I you know, follow your passion. And uh, it's only if you really Follow your passion. I was lucky because I very early in life found it. I know for a lot of my students, they're searching much longer. But you know it when you find yourself ultimately in the right spot. And it's like falling in love. And just keep searching until you reach that stage. Because only then 
you can give it your all, give it your all best talents, your skills, and you can work so hard and then nobody can stop you. So I know these times are more difficult than, than ever, but you know, I went into science not to earn money. I, I could have become a bank director if I wanted to. I just wanted to look at plankton and I'm still doing it. <laughs>